Okay, so a couple announcements. First, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the announcement from the ENR program about Ed Warner, who's coming to talk about um, examples of cooperative conservation from sage grouse to water. So, uh, in case you haven't seen that announcement yet, uh, it's next Tuesday, right after this class. So you guys will have a good excuse to make sure I get done on time. So I can go over and talk and listen to him. Uh, so Ed Warner is a small philanthropist and conservationist. I'm sure he's somebody pretty important. That's what the ENR program has brought him in. Uh, but this notion of cooperative conservation, and again, uh, he seems to be talking about sage grass and water from sage grass to water. I suspect it might actually have quite a bit to do with some of the things we're going to be talking about towards the end of the semester. So that's why I'm going to try and find some, some inspiring new examples to draw on. So Tuesday, February 7th, 4 p.m. in the Berry Center Auditorium. There's also lunch at noon. Usually takes me about two weeks. I'm going to try and do a better job this semester, but the history repeats itself. It's closer to two weeks rather than one. And I apologize for that. It's just the nature of it. Do I have grad students to do it? No, we have grad students. No. You guys would love it if I let my grad students grade your papers. They're harder than I am. <laughs> if your answer doesn't match mine exactly, they'll take 75% of your course off. So I've tried that in the past as a way to speed things up. It doesn't speed things up at all. It just makes two people have to do the grading completely instead of one. So I'll ask for your patience right from the get-go. Um, but I am always willing to move deadlines. And so given SRM absence, given that I'm not going to have your homework back until Thursday, um, exam one, let's do thurs uh, Thursday, February 9th. Okay, so a week from this Thursday. I'll give you a little bit more time to study the, I'll get your homeworks back to you on Tuesday, on this coming Thursday, uh, this supply and demand stuff, you can look at them, figure out what went wrong and why from the see me in the following week or Friday, um, hopefully there'll be enough time so that by Thursday you've got things under control and feel pretty comfortable. Um, I don't think I'll put any of this material on the next, on this upcoming exam. Um, it's just too soon. You need time to practice the material. Uh, and I need time for these guys and missing people to, to get caught up. So I don't anticipate this will be on the exam. Any questions before I get started? All right, so we're done with supply and demand. We're switching gears. Uh, we're going to start talking about how to make good economic decisions about how much of activities to do. Um, and I want to start with the most kind of simple situation. And that's where you have a small number of possibilities available to you, a small number of options. So maybe you just have two restoration projects to choose from. And your budget isn't big enough to do both of them. You have to pick which one to implement. Problem is, the projects, one takes one year to complete but only generates one year's worth of benefit, and you have to do it every year thereafter. The other one costs a bunch of money up front, but the benefits last for 20 years. How do you compare two projects that are so vastly different? Okay, and so we're going to start out in that, that relatively simple framework of having discrete numbers of options, a limited number of options, um, but there are some complications because they have different time frames and different after that, so after this set of material, we we'll move into a, a different type of, a different subset of decisions. Decisions where you have a whole continuum of options available to you. It's not just do this or do this. It's raise one cow 
cows, two cows, three cows, four cows, five cows, all the way to infinity cows, how many cows could you raise? Or acres, you could do zero acres, 0 0.25 acres, 0 0.26 acres, all the way up to infinity acres. Those continuous types of decisions um, is what we'll do next, and that will take us several weeks to do. But I want to start out with something that's relatively straightforward. This will be an interesting experiment usually do this material towards the end of the semester. This year, I wanted to try a different approach and see if it made, made better sense to you guys, kind of the flow of information. So. All right, so with these discrete decisions, how do we deal with the fact that we have different time frames, different budgets, different flows of benefits across time? We need a couple of tools, and the tools aren't very much fun. They're going to involve boring mathematical formulas. But what's cool is that these formulas are going to be valuable to you for figuring out your car payments on your next new car. Okay, or, you know, so you can walk into the dealership and already know how much you can afford to pay on a monthly basis and therefore how much that implies you should pay for this car. Or given, you know, you walk into your bank and ask for a loan for a beginner farmer or rancher, you can sit down and figure out under what terms should you accept this loan. So it's going to seem a little abstract at first. Um, eventually we'll get back to this point about having multiple projects to choose from and how you make them so that they're comparable to each other. So I want to start out with a question. Carson, I have three dollars in my pocket. Would you prefer a dollar right now? Not a soda. I have a soda out of lots of I'm making a dollar twenty five. <laughs> Prices rise the time, right? Would you prefer it's a little off from my example, but it's real. Update my slides for real prices. A dollar twenty five right now. Or come back on Thursday and I'll give you not just that dollar twenty five. I'll give you everything in my pocket, which is the full three dollars. So a dollar five twenty-five today, right now, or three dollars on Thursday. Everybody think about this decision for yourselves. No right or wrong answer, just your personal preference. Take a dollar twenty-five today, or wait a couple of days and take home three dollars. <throat> Who would take a dollar twenty-five right now? But like I said, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's per personal preference. I'm not setting you up to look like a fool or anything. Is this right? Is this money guarantee or is it all some kind of financial question? Okay. Okay. That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Think about the chances of me being here on Thursday. Take Okay. Raise your hand if you want to take the dollar twenty-five today. Okay, so four or five of you. Who wants to wait till Thursday in order to get three dollars instead? All right, excellent. All right, let's do it again. A dollar twenty-five today, or wait till Thursday and get a total of two dollars. Okay, dollar five twenty-five today, or on Thursday. Okay, raise your hand if you still want it today. Dollar twenty-five right now, or wait till Thursday to get two dollars. All right, we've got a few more people who are willing to take the dollar twenty-five today. You see where I'm going with this? Dollar twenty-five today, or a dollar fifty on Thursday? Who wants a dollar twenty-five today? Who's going to wait and take a dollar fifty on Thursday? Interesting. Okay, and it finally, if it were a buck twenty-five and a buck twenty-five, a buck twenty-five today, or wait till Thursday and get your buck twenty-five then. Who wants it today? Does anybody want to wait till Thursday just for the fun of it? That wouldn't make any good sense, would it? All right, you've just learned the concept of discounting. Okay, what economists call discounting. And what we mean by discounting is just the fact that people have preferences.
preferences for time when it comes to money. Okay? It's the time value of money. Tell me the reason that <coughs> you might prefer, so those of you who wanted the money today, in most of those circumstances, most of the experiments we just did, what were some of the reasons going through your mind for wanting it today instead of waiting until Thursday? You didn't guarantee it. Right. You don't know. There's risk involved. You don't know if I'm going to show up on Thursday and follow through with my offer. Okay. So by taking it today, you avoid risk. <clears throat> by waiting, you take on risk. Any other thoughts that went through people's mind as they were trying to decide if they wanted it today instead of waiting and getting more in the future? Um, like if you're going to purchase something today, yeah, you bet. Maybe you have urgent purchase needs. Or if we had done this over a longer time frame, maybe you'd be thinking, well, gosh, the price of that soda might be $1.50. Or it might be $2 if I wait to buy it. But if I buy it today, it's only $1.25. Right? So there's this notion that through time, prices tend to go up because of inflation. Inflation is just the general rise of price. Um, and so inflation is another reason that people often prefer to have to get things today rather than wait for them in the future. You get the money today, it will buy more. All right, if I gave you $1.25 today, that $1.25 will buy more today than that same $1.25 a couple of years from now. So get the money now and spend it. Well, it buys more soda for you, okay? Or save it. Exactly. If I gave you $1.25 today, not a lot of money, but multiply that by a couple of decimal points. If I give that money for you today, you can invest it and earn interest on it. Whereas if you wait for it, that's lost time, lost interest. Okay, so these are all some of the great reasons, inflation, the fact that you could earn interest, and the fact that if you wait, there's a risk that the offer will go away, that the opportunity will disappear. So for these three reasons, is not the same as a dollar tomorrow. And so if you're thinking about a restoration project that requires, that generates, let's do the benefit side, a restoration project, one of which generates benefits today, compared to a different restoration project that takes a couple of years to start generating benefits. Even if they, in the end, in total, Let's say they both generated $10,000 worth of benefit. Would you prefer the project that generates those benefits sooner or later? It depends on the project. Okay, what makes you say that? Well, because some projects you want to get done early, like quickly, to, to show the public that you did something and that that money is going somewhere. Okay. And then they can see it later because it's kind of like instant gratification for them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point that there might be <clears throat> kind of publicity benefits to having projects that have benefits up front. So even if the benefits were smaller, it might the, the restoration benefits were smaller, those added publicity benefits, that's another benefit. Okay, so there's definitely that reason for wanting to do it sooner. But if you had two projects that generated the same amount of benefits, including publicity benefits, you would want to do it sooner, for the one that generates benefits sooner rather than later. What if we flip this around on its head? And you guys, saw, for some reason, owed me money. And I said, Carson, you can either pay me a dollar today or a dollar on Thursday. What would you rather do? And again, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's everybody's personal preference. How many of you, right, okay, so you can either pay me a dollar today or a dollar on Thursday, or if you want more time, like if you want to have a bigger time frame, you can think about paying me a dollar today or a dollar a year from today. If you're the one paying that cost, would you rather incur the cost today or sometime in the future? If the money, if the value, dollar, dollar is going to stay the same. What would you rather do? Okay. Anybody want to hold off? Maybe a year from now? Well, 
on what you're going to do with your dollar in the meantime. <laughs>
why we have to, it makes it very hard to compare those two projects. Five million up front for 30 years of benefits, and $10,000 a year for a little bit of benefit every year over the next 30 years. Really hard to compare those, it's like apples and oranges. But you, as managers, have to compare them and come up with a decision. The tools today that we're gonna, gonna learn um, will teach you how to make those apples and apples so that you really can compare them fairly and make the best decision. That sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Get ready. So it's all down here. It's all down here. All right. Um, I think this is, let's see what's on this one. We've already kind of did this. We've done this. I borrowed 100 bucks from you today. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to pay you back a year from now. The question is, how much do I owe you? Are you going to just let me pay you the $100 back a year from now? <coughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> All right, what have you given up? When you gave me the $100 and you let me borrow it for an entire year, while you sit and wait for me to pay you back, what have you given up? You've given up interest that we could have earned on it. You've given up the fact that a year from now, $100 isn't going to buy nearly as much as it does today. Okay, so that's inflation. And you're taking on the risk that you may never see me again, or your 100 bucks. And you should, you should charge me something for that. I mean, even though if I run out on you, just because you've charged me more money, you're not actually going to get that money back. But if you do get your money back, if I do come back here from now and pay you, you should maybe pay you for having to have take, taken that risk, for having to worry the entire year about whether or not you're ever going to see me again. I should pay you for that inconvenience. Okay? So you're, now you should make me pay more than 100 And so how do we do this? Uh, you can say, well, maybe prices are going to rise 5% over the next year. So a gallon of gas that costs three dollars a gallon right now, a year from now is going to cost, uh, let's see, one percent would be three cents, fifteen, one percent would be three cents, do that by five percent, that's fifteen cents, so a gallon of gas that costs three dollars today is going to cost three fifteen next year, right, okay. so charge me five percent for inflation, in this case, hundred dollars. Times 1.05, right? That's $100. The one is to represent that you make. You're going to make me give you back your original 100 plus an additional 5%. Okay, so I'm going to have to give you an extra five bucks because of inflation. Uh, suppose that you could have taken that money and put it in the bank and earned 4% interest. So you should make me pay four dollars for that lost opportunity to earn interest. Um, and then. Whatever you, however you think, however risky you think I am. If you think there's a 5% chance I won't be here a year from now to pay back, charge me 5% of the risk you're taking. It's an extra $5. So if I were you, I'd say, yeah, I'd let you, I'll let you borrow 100 bucks today, but a year from now I want 114 back. And then I get to decide whether I think that's fair and worth it. So that's the general premise um, about why money today is not equivalent to money tomorrow. Oh, let's see what else we have. I think you guys get the point. There's a couple of additional slides. If it's still kind of you have, you know, you're not quite comfortable with the idea. There's some other examples. Um, so you did some work for your, for your neighbor rancher, and the neighbor says, "Hey, I'll uh, I can't pay you right now." But a year from now, I'll give you 114 bucks. And you're like, crap. I did the work because I wanted the money. Because there's some fancy new something out there I want to buy. So what do you do to turn around and, and, and ask the neighbor? <laughs> you, could ask, you could. You could ask him to do it in installments. If you wanted the money up front, how could you negotiate?
associate with them, what would you guys do? Say, thanks for the offer for 114 bucks a year from now, but you know what? I'd be equally happy with, how much would you be willing to accept if he gave it to you today? Less, something less than that, right? Okay, so instead of before we were just talking about taking money in the present and thinking about how much is it equivalent to in the future, this example is just asking to do it in the reverse. Your neighbor offers you 114 a year from now. The question is, how much would you be willing to accept? How much less would you be willing to accept if he gave it to you today? You'd be willing to accept less for the convenience of having it today, the opportunity to have it. So you might turn around and say, you know, give me 100 bucks today and we'll call it even. I'm willing to give up $14 for the convenience and opportunity to have that money today instead of having to wait. So just the opposite, flipping the coin the opposite direction is all. All right, summary slides. So throughout these presentations, I'm gonna be referring to something called your discount rate. Your discount rate is just your personal preference about how much more valuable money is today than in the future. And we've already talked about kind of four, three or four different components. What you should take into consideration when you figure out how much more you value money today versus in the future. Um, so when you hear discount rate, I'm just referring to kind of the sum of these three considerations, these three issues that make us think differently about money through time. All right, our first example. Suppose your discount rate is 14%. Okay, what does that mean? That means you would be equally happy with $100 today or $114 a year from now. Okay, that's what the discount rate kind of is telling you. The two values that you're equally happy with today versus a year from now. introduce you to another a, a new an extra step new step so I borrowed the hundred bucks from you if I actually do pay you back a year from today I'm gonna owe you and your discount rate is 14 percent discount rate okay we'll leave it at that for now I'm gonna pay you back in a year we've already figured out that if your discount rate is 14 percent 0.14 that I should pay you 114 a year. Before we go any further with these interest rates, for those of you who have always been uncomfortable with percents, and I was for a very long time, 14% is the same as 0.14. Right? 0.14, if you want to convert it back to 100%, you just multiply it by 100 percent what we mean by that there's two zeros on the 100 percent that just means move your decimal plate two places that gives you 14 and now you can use the percent sign next okay so we're going to be moving between these you know i say 14 percent but then i turn around and i use it in decimal form get comfortable with that and if you're not comfortable with it um, i'm happy to, to sit down with you on your own time to, to get more comfortable all right, why do I owe you 114? All right, up here I have $100 times a dollar for, or times 1.14. $100 times 1.14. What this really is, again, just for those who are who aren't very comfortable with math, all I've really done. The original 100, right? Do your factoring. 100 times 1 gives you 100 plus 100 times 0.14. That's the discount rate or the interest rate. I use those terms interchangeably. You're charging me a 14% interest rate because that's your personal discount rate. So what do we get? The original 100 that I that I borrowed from you plus another $14. Oh. Okay, so that's that's why 
this works. Okay, because it's just a simplification of this whole process. What if I don't pay you back a year from now? I chill up. I've got your money. Actually, I don't have your money, but I'm here. I'll get you your money <coughs> if you give me one more year. I swear. I just need one more year. How much should you tar charge me? for borrowing it a second year. How much should I owe you at the end of the second year? How much do I owe you already? 114. And if I showed up with that 114, you could have taken it and stuck it in an interest account, on my interest bearing account, and earned interest on my extra $14, right? So, how much do I owe you next time you see me? How do we figure that out? This notion, right, as we went through time, you weren't just charging me interest on the original $100, right? At first, you just charged me interest on the original $100. But the next time around, you charged me interest on my interest. The next time around, you charged me interest on my interest, and inside of this $29 was interest on interest on interest. Right, so this notion of charging interest on interest on interest is what we call compounding. And it's what your banks do to what your lenders and credit card companies do to you. They don't just charge you interest on the original balance. They charge you interest on interest. So when you go and think about borrowing money, buying a truck, the sticker price of that truck says $1,000. That's a pretty cheap truck. $40,000. <laughs> By the time you get done paying for that truck, if you have to take out a loan, and oh, you're going to have paid out a lot more than that sticker price, right? Because they're going to pay you interest on interest. So, for the rest of today, we're going to work on formulas for calculating how much you're going to owe in the future if you borrow money, depending on the interest rate, how long the loan is for, uh, and how often do they charge you interest on interest. In this example, you only charge me interest once a year. So you only charge me interest on interest once a year. What if every month you called me up and asked me if you had your money when I didn't? Every month you charge me interest on interest. It'd be pretty crappy. Okay, so can you imagine if we had to actually do this process? line by line for every year of that 30 year restoration project we were talking about we figure out how much it was going to cost at the very end but for each of those years we had to do this stupid calculation I know Excel's fast it wouldn't be that big of a hassle pre-Excel that would have been a big hassle so we have formulas the first formula is compounding so if you had known right from the get-go that when you <coughs> Let me that hundred dollars, it was going to take me three years to pay it back. If I'd known that right from the start, we could have, in a snap, calculated how much I was going to owe you. 
and that's a compounding formula. Get comfortable with this formula. There's two basic, not even two. This is the only formula I will make you memorize. Because it's simple enough. And it should make relatively good sense to you. So here's what it means. Value zero. V zero, V naught. That's the not always means original in this class. Where did we start? So the value we started with, V naught, was 100 bucks. I is the interest rate you're either being charged or you're charging someone. Okay. I is the interest rate, or if it's you deciding what it should be, it's your personal discount rate. And I'll, again, I'll use those pretty interchangeably. Is this the present value or the future value? All right. V0 is present value. Yeah, zero means today, the present. Okay, so this is the present value, the 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. I is the decimal form of the interest rate you're charging me or the discount rate. So if it was 14%, the I would be 0 0.14. Your bank usually reports interest rates and percentages. Before you use this formula, just convert that to the decimal form. N, the number of periods you have to pay it off. In this case, we're, we're talking about the number of years, and so N is three. And what are we trying to solve for? I borrowed 100 bucks, I understand the terms of the loan. What I want to know for myself is the future value of, of that 100 bucks that I, that, that I borrowed. In the future, what am I going to have to pay? So n, right? N is just representing n years from now, three years from now. What's the value going to be of this original hundred dollars to borrow? So if your interest is like fourteen percent right now, and you pay that like monthly, you should take fourteen divided by twelve by which one to be. Yeah, and we'll work on that later. You bet. And we're going to learn that it's really important to figure out um, if the interest rate is recorded on an annual basis. So banks usually report an annual interest rate. If that's what you're going to use, then N needs to be a number of years. If your bank gives you a monthly interest rate, then N needs to be a number of months. Okay, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute, that I and N have to be in the same time frame. All right, so you just plug and chug. If you can remember the formula, um, you just plug and chug. And essentially what we see, right, is that when we did this silly little example where I came back to you each and three years, what we were really doing is taking $100 times 1.14 times 1.14 times 1.14. Okay. Or $100 times 1.14 raised to the three. So these formulas actually make sense. They come from somewhere. If you sit down with the previous slide and figure out, okay, originally I paid 100 times 1 plus 1, 0 0.14, the next time I paid this 114 times 1.14. And the next time I paid the 129 times 1.14. That formula some simplifies down to this, $100. And there we go, we get the same answer as before. All right, so that's compounding. Compounding is calculating future value. Practice. You want to buy some land outside of Laramie? It's a good deal. Twenty thousand bucks for an acre. It's actually pretty darn cheap in Laramie. I won't tell you how much I'm about to pay tomorrow when I close on a piece of property in front of my own house. So I've been doing these calculations. bank is going to charge you 10% interest. And again, where do they come up with this number? Yeah, it's there. It's the bank's discount rate. How risky they think you are. Plus, the opportunities they're giving up on interest earned. All right, if they kept the money instead of lending it to you, they probably could have earned, you know, 4%. They tack on a couple of extra percentage points because they think you're a little bit risky. Uh, and they tack on some extra points for inflation. 
and they tell you you've got five years to pay it back. The sticker price of the land is $20,000. We're not going to do payments right yet. Making monthly payments is a little more complicated with the calculations. What you're going to do is you're going to borrow the $20,000 today to pay the landowner, and five years from now, you're going to walk to the bank with a lot of cash and pay them off all at once. Okay, so you borrow the money, and five years later, you pay the whole thing back. How much do you owe the bank? Make sure you can use the formula. If I stole away your fancy calculator that has the little compound button, mine doesn't have that. I used to have a calculator that didn't. Let's see what happens when we compound monthly. So here's just our kind of a baseline example to start with. Uh, this is going back to our hundred dollars, fourteen percent over three years. Okay, oh, that's how much I owe you. What if instead you were going to charge me interest on interest every month? So every month you were going to sit down and do these calculations. Here's the trick. When you lend me, when you loan me that money, you told me I had an annual interest rate of 14%, but that you were going to compound monthly. When you're working with this stuff, always pay what matters is how often they're going to compound. How often are they going to charge you once a year? Or are they going to do those calculations every month? If they've told you that they're going to compound monthly, the first thing you have to do is get the interest rate into a monthly rate and then figure out how many instead of n instead of being three years of repayment turn that into how many months of repayment till repayment okay. so to convert monthly uh, annual interest rate to monthly just take that 14 percent leave it in decimals to begin with or leave it in percentage to begin with 14% over the entire year, spread out, out evenly over 12 months. That spits out 1.17, the percent sign is still there. Convert it to decimal so that we can use it in our formula. Just move the decimal two places. That leaves space for one zero. 0.0117 is our monthly interest rate or 1.17 percent all right so now we got our monthly rate and we're ready to do it well we're almost ready to do our calculation they're going to compound monthly over three years but they're doing it monthly so we need to translate that three years equal to 36 months so they're telling you they're going to compound they're going to charge you interest on interest 36 times over the next three years we're going to do this series of recalculations 36 times, but they're doing it at a lower rate. Okay, so if that's the terms of your agreement, I'm not going to owe you 148, I'm actually going to owe you 152. I'm going to owe you even more 
because you're charging me interest on interest more often. So, first important lesson for your credit cards, for your automobile, your next automobile, for your student loans, pay attention to which rate they give you. Are they telling you an annual rate or a monthly rate or a daily rate? There's some credit cards out there. Okay. But what kind of rate are they giving you? And how often are they going to do the compounding? Okay, and before you do your calculation, make sure that however often they're doing the compounding is how is the terms that you've got the interest rate and the number, you know, number of time periods turned into the same time frame. Monthly, 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 or annually, annually, annual. I saw an ad the other day for a lending company, a for-profit lending company, that was saying, get cash now, right? get cash quick. We lend money to anybody. Now in the fine print, they literally said, annual interest rate is 120 They didn't tell me how often they compounded. Lord knows. Hopefully they only compounded annually, not monthly. Think of that. You borrow a hundred dollars, and let's even assume that they're nice and only compound once. A year from now, how much do you owe them? It's 120% interest. You owe them the original hundred dollars back. And how much more? Another hundred and twenty dollars. Two hundred and twenty bucks. $100 borrowed. Holy crap. There's some scary lending terms out there. Same with your credit cards. Make sure they're not compounding daily. Frightening. <laughs> so, the more often they compound, the more often you're going to be paying interest on your interest on your interest, and the more you're going to owe in the end. Okay. Same, same example up top. Let's see what else we can change to make it even scarier. You look close at the fine print, and the annual interest rate is not 14%. That is your monthly interest rate. This is the like the 120% annual interest rate, right? It'd be even worse than that. So read your terms carefully. Figure this out. They've offered you a monthly interest rate of 14%. They're going to compound monthly over the next three years. You borrow 100 bucks initially. How much are you going to owe? Right, we thought compounding monthly was bad enough, but now they've jacked your monthly interest rate up a whole bunch. How much worse is that going to make things? <laughs> so what do we got? Remember, use your formula, not just your calculators. Our original amount plus one plus the interest rate. Again, we're going to we know they're compounding monthly, so this needs to be a monthly interest rate. They've told us the monthly interest rate is 14%. That's 0 0.14. What's the end? 36 months. It's a compound monthly. Anybody else get that? Is that right? That possibly is right? Good Lord. <laughs> you can get somebody to pay you those terms. You should, borrow, you should definitely let them borrow your 100 bucks. Why did they charge? Why would somebody charge 120% interest? This company that whose commercial I saw, I literally saw this on TV the other day. Compound daily because it's a quick, small chunk of money they need to make money on it. All right, so it yeah. Only a hundred dollars to get from. I don't get paid till Friday, but I got bills through Monday. Yeah, so maybe it's going to be over a pretty short term, and when it comes to paying your bills really critical bills like your rent, people are pretty desperate and they're, they're willing to pay a pretty high daily interest rate. So maybe they compound, they have a, a high daily interest rate and they're compounding daily. And that translates into this giant annual interest rate. Okay, why else? There's a lot of risk associated with allowing anyone to borrow. Who do they let borrow the <coughs> money? Anybody. What do the commercials say? Anybody. Anybody. For every person that comes in and borrows money and pays them back, how many customers do they never see again? A lot of their customers, they're flight risk, right? They'll never, 
a lot of them they won't see again. So how much do they have to charge the person, the few people that will actually come back and pay the money back? Enough to make up for all the money they lost on the people who never came back, right? And that's that risk. All right, let's keep going. Here's the take home point. Be aware of your interest rate. Are they reporting it as annual, monthly, daily? Be aware of how often they're compounding your interest. Annually, monthly, God forbid, daily. And when you do these calculations, make sure that if they're compounding annually, that you're using an annual interest rate and an annual N. If they're compounding monthly, you're using a monthly rate. And N is in terms of months, not years. Same for daily. <coughs> application of extension let's see this is just something you can practice on your own it's slightly more complicated the only thing so again we're on this twenty thousand dollar parcel land from the bank uh, in Laramie you don't need to borrow the full twenty thousand okay maybe you only need to borrow ten thousand from the bank you've got ten thousand in your savings account that you can use for purchase you guys already know how to do this part? How much are you going to owe the bank? How much is your own money? Is it free? If you didn't buy this land, what could you do with your money instead? This actually used to be a realistic number. Not anymore, I realize. Saving accounts are barely earning any interest rate. It almost is free. <laughs> but back when savings rates were actually decent, your money's not free. You take it out of the bank to pay for that land, you what have you given up? The interest you could have earned. And at the very least, that's what you've given up. Okay? Or the opportunity to buy something else. Okay? So even though it's your money, it's not free. There's an opportunity cost to using your money. By choosing to take it out and buy that land, you've given up a certain amount of interest earned. And if you really want to know how much that land is going to cost you, you better account for the interest that you had to give up on your own money to do it. Okay, so there's two separate calculations here. It's the same calculation, their same formula. Uh, you know, that raised to the N. It's just we need to do it in two separate chunks because the terms are different. The bank has an interest rate of you know 10% over five years. Over that same period, for your personal money, maybe you were only able to earn 6% interest on it. You're not a risk to yourself. You know where to find yourself five years from now. You don't pay the money back. Okay. So it's mostly just this lost interest. Um, so do the calculation for this. For the ten thousand dollars borrowed from the bank, do this calculation for your savings account. Notice that I've assumed that your bank is really kind and compounds your savings account monthly, just to make it more fun. Your loan they're only compounding annually, but your savings they would have compounded every month for you. You earned more interest because of it. How much is this land really going to cost? In five years, how much will you have paid Here's how much if you if you really paid yourself back and had charged yourself 6% interest to make up for the interest that you should have been earning on that money or could have earned on it. Here's how much you would owe yourself. Okay. 
This one's lower because we had a lower interest rate, even though we were compounding more often. So that, again, that $20,000 parcel will actually will end up working out. Again, a lot of people won't pay themselves interest. They won't actually come back five years from now and put $13,489 back in their savings account. So technically, that's how they should think about the cost of this land. By taking that $10,000 out of your savings account, you've given up almost $3,500 worth of interest under these conditions. And so that's an opportunity cost that you should account for. Everybody on track? Got the hang of it? I've got some practice stuff for you at the end of class that you can take and do on your own, and I'll post a key you know, in a couple days or so. All right, so something you actually care about. Two range improvement projects. Project A will generate $1,000 worth of net benefit. So I don't know how much it costs, but after we paid off those costs, we still had $1,000 worth of benefits left. That's the net benefit. Okay. Take the whole benefits minus the cost, how much we got left. This project generates $1,000 worth of net benefit today. Project B doesn't generate benefits until next year. Okay, and those net benefits are $25 higher, but you have to wait a year to get them. Okay, pretty contrived, but we'll start simple and work our way up to more complex. Which project do we prefer? Can you tell? Not much you can do with math and have really fast. We looked ahead and saw what interest rates I was going to be charging you. You can't tell. These are apples and oranges. What if it had been $1,000 today versus $1,000 a year from today? Could we tell? Yep, that's apples and apples. What if it was um, $1,000 today versus $1,025 today? Could you tell? Look at that. Apples and apples. Right, but the fact that they both have, they have different values and different times makes it impossible to compare them. Okay, if they had the same value over different times, or different values over the same time, right, if they have one thing in common, then you can compare them without changing them, like having to fill the numbers. But when they have nothing in common, we've got to do some calculations. Which project should you choose? Let's assume that your personal discount rate is 5%. Okay, that's how much you value. That's your time value of money. And let's just assume uh, we'll, we'll compound annually. There's two ways to do this. The way that we have been doing it. So you could do one more round of practice. We could calculate the future value of both projects, right? We're, we've got apples and oranges. We want to make them apples and apples. There's two ways to do it. There's the way we have been doing it. That's calculating the future value of both projects. Get them in the same time period, the future, using that formula we just used. This guy's already in the future. He's a year from today. That is the future. But we don't have to do anything with him we would just need to bring this guy from the present into the future. And we can do that using our little formula. Okay. So we use compound to calculate the future value of project A. It's a simple little formula, 5% interest for one year, compounded annually. The future value of this project A, right? We did it. We get that $1,000 today. We stick it in our savings account and earn 5% for one year. How much we have a year from today? Now they're both in future terms, and we can compare them. Future value of project A is 1050 versus future value of project B it was already in the future, 1025. Now it's obvious which project is preferred, right? Because they have something in common. They're in the same time period. So project A is preferred. We can also go in the opposite direction. This is compounding to calculate future value. 
instead of getting them both in future value terms, we could instead get them both in present value terms. Okay, it doesn't matter which. You can either do that or this. You get the same answer, it's just a matter of which formula you want to use. We haven't talked about this option yet. Okay, we've only talked about putting things in future value. Let's talk about putting them in present value. That's called discounting. Same formula, we're just going to rearrange it. Okay. Project A, we receive $1,000 today. Project B gives us a future value. We need to calculate its present value. This is kind of like the rancher offering you pay to pay you 114 a year from today. And you're like, I don't want it a year from today. I would be equally happy with how much today. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's what we're trying to calculate. How much today would make me equally happy as 1,025 a year from now. So use discounting to calculate the present value of project B. Here's the formula. It's the same exact formula as before. We've just rearranged it to solve what we actually solve for what we actually care about. Okay, so before we had v n was equal to v zero times one plus i to the n. So before we were given present value, and we're trying to solve for future. Now, we've got just the opposite. We've got future. We want to solve for present. So to do that, we just pull this guy over to the left and put this guy on the right. And we just switch these guys. Just do a little algebra. Solve for this guy, because he's the one we're interested in. How do we do that? We just divide both sides by the stuff that we want to get rid of. Those two terms cancel so that we're left with the thing that we want to solve for. And voila, there's our, com our discounting formula. Okay, so same formula, you just rearrange for the part that you want to solve for. Present value equals future value divided by the same one plus i. So, help me calculate the present value of project B. What does 1,025 represent? What is that? It's the future value. Vn, you plug it in there. Same terms as before, I assume 5% and compounded annually for one year. If those terms, 5% compounded annually, what this is telling us, how do we interpret this? That given our personal time preferences, we would be equally happy with $976 today, instead of waiting a year to get $1,025. that make sense? If you get $976 today, what can you do with it for a year? Put it in a bank, earn interest. 5% for a year, and how much would you have in the future if you did that with this $976? 1025 They're equivalent to each other. So now we've got Project B in present terms. We've got Project A in present terms. Now they're comparable. Would you rather have $976 with the equivalent of $976 today? You're not actually going to get $976. That's not how Project B works. But 976 is the equivalent value of getting 1,025 a year from now. Okay, so would you rather have 900, the equivalent of $976 today or $1,000 today? Pretty easy to compare, right? Once again, as should be the case, the either approach gives you the same answer. Project A is the preferred project. Given this particular assumption about interest rates and compounding and the lifespan and whatnot. All right, here you go. My hunters in the group. You sell guided elk hunts. Elk 
creditors often require money up front, kind of as a deposit. Mm -hmm. So you sell guy the elk hunt, and you typically book them a year in advance. And your customer calls and says, listen, I know you want, you usually ask people to pay right up front. So I know option A is for me to pay you $4,500 today. So let me make you an offer. I'll tell you what, I really don't want to send you $4,500 today. That money's valuable to me. I've got some investment opportunities. I hate to cut you a check. So here's the deal. If you're willing to wait a year, I'll pay you when I show up for my hunt. I'll pay you $5,000 instead of $4,500. How do you compare those if you're with this business person? got your gut feeling, right? You know what kind of bills you have to pay. But you, now you have a formula to help you think about it objectively. And again, there's two ways to do this. Right now, they're in different time frames. This one's today, this one's a year from today. Apples and oranges. You can either get them apples to apples by calculating the future value of $4,500. Or you can get them oranges to oranges by calculating the present value of $5,000 a year from today. So you can either compound or discount to get the answer. It just depends on which way you want to go. So practice that one. Um, interest, thank you. It's <laughs> an important piece of information. Based on your personal preferences, uh, your time value money is Okay, so you've got, money is obviously important for you to have today, because um, you've got a guide and you've got some bills to pay. Um, if you don't have the money from your hunter, maybe you have to go and borrow money from the bank at a 7% interest rate, plus a 3% risk if the hunter never shows up, even though you've invested in a bunch of resources for them. Assume compound annually, or if you want to be more want to practice something more difficult, you can change those conditions. <clears throat> In my slide, I went ahead and calculated the present value of option B. I wanted to put them both in present terms, oranges to oranges, but you can do it the other way if you want. I just don't have that answer. Slide. <laughs> okay, so if you choose to put them all and put them both in present terms, here's again what you're asking. He offers you $5,000 a year from today. What you're trying to ask yourself, you know you can't get this money earlier. If you choose this option, you're going to have to wait a year. So you, this is kind of a hypothetical. You're saying hypothetically, that's what he was offering me. I would be equally happy with how much today. Okay, if I had this much, if I had a certain amount today for a year, how, you know, how much of this would it take to end up at $5,000 a year now? Because okay, you're kind of working backwards. So the equivalent of $5,000 a year from today is, at these terms, $45,000, 45 today. Be equally happy with those two options. Okay, so that's the present value of be. Now you can compare them. Would you rather have 45-45, the equivalent of 45-45 today, or 4500 today? Now they're both in today's terms. It's pretty easy to, to conclude what's preferable. Okay, option B in this case is actually preferable. Given your opportunity cost of money, it is worth waiting a year. He's going to pay you more than the equivalent of getting 4500 today. All right, so, just a summary. Here's the formula, here's what it means, compounding versus discounting. Um, pick up, we've still got five minutes, so don't start looking things away yet. I'll put these on each end of the room. Um, these are just gonna be, just for practice, not for credit. I want you to still be working on your supply and demand for the exam, so 
Worked for a few of these, we've got a lot to go still. Um, next, let's see, can we do this one? Yeah, you can do this one, just another example. Future Farmers and Ranchers of America. Five years from now, when you graduate from college, you would like to have enough money to purchase a million dollar ranch. This is a simple version of the problem. And what I want to know is how much money would you have to put into your savings account today? A big lump sum. So that five years from now, you had a million dollars to do it. We if you earn 3% interest on your account, and you have five years where it's earned interest for you, and it's compounded annually. These questions can often be overwhelming. The key, the first key is to determine what information I've given you. I've given you a figure of a million dollars. The only question is, is that a present value or a future value? It's future. So what must we be looking for? We must need to solve for present. Which formula helps us do that? Discounting. All right, so you break out your discounting formula. One million is VN. 1.03 to the five. How much money do you need to deposit today so that you can buy your million dollar ranch five years from now? Is it a million dollars? Nope. Eight hundred sixty-two thousand. Sweet, we can do that. Come on, no problem. Just call your grandma. See if you've got some money spare in the bank for you. All right. Um, so we just let me just make sure this isn't another easy example. See where we're going next. Opportunity to purchase land for five hundred dollars an acre. In 10 years, you think it's going to be worth twice that. So this is an investment opportunity. Oh, yeah, let's do this one before you leave, because this is cool. You need to find a loan. All right, so you've identified this piece of property for $500. You speculate that 10 years from now, it's going to be worth twice that. What information have I given you so far? What is $500 an acre? What's $1,000 an acre? Speculated future value. OK, we'll just assume we're good information. What can I possibly, I've got, and I, what's this piece of information? And what's the only piece of information you know I'm going to ask for? Interest rate. Cool opportunity, right? You know how much it's worth now. You know how much, you think you know how much it's going to be worth in the future. You're speculating, but you've got to think yes. You've got 10 years to hold on to this land as an investment. And the question is, you're shopping around at local banks. They're offering you different interest rates. What's the highest interest rate you can afford to pay and just break even on this investment? Like if you pay this much interest, you're just going to break even on the project in the end. So if you can find interest rates lower than that, you'll make profit. If you can only find interest rates higher than that, it's not worth investing. What is that break-even level of interest? Same formula, just solving for a different piece. All right, so you gotta use a little bit of algebra. The I is a little harder to get rid of. So let's do, uh, we'll start with this version because it's the one I can remember. Here's what we need to solve for. Exponents suck. If you don't remember that, if you don't get to work with them very often, they kind of suck. Let's get the V0 out of the way first. All right, we're trying to isolate this guy, but there's a bunch of stuff in our way. You've got to follow your rules of algebra. You guys remember this? Come, Des. It's fewer and fewer every year that know what the heck that means. 
It's the order you have to do things in in order for it to get the right answer at the end. First you have to deal with parentheses, then exponents, then multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, right? Um, in this case, in order to get to the I, we do have a bunch of stuff in the way. It's just a matter of getting some of that other stuff out of the way. But first we can just get rid of the VO, no problem. Just divide, get it over on the other side. Okay, get closer. It looks like I violated PEMDES, but we only have to worry about PEMDES when we get to this part. The next thing that's in the way is the exponent. Anybody remember how to get rid of exponents? I wouldn't if I were you. How do we get rid of exponents? Is it square root? Almost. Yeah, the more generic version of that, when we're taking the square root, that's when the exponent is a 2. But more generically, we can get rid of it by multiplying the exponent by 1 over itself, because the n and the n will cancel. But anything we do on this side, we have to do over here. So we have to multiply, we have to raise the entire thing on the left-hand side to the same thing, to the 1 over n. So now we've got 1 plus i equals this big nasty thing. We're so close. What do we have to do now? All that's left is plus i. I'm trying to isolate the i. We can finally subtract, right? We got rid of the exponent. Now we can get rid of the addition or subtraction. So i, we just are going to subtract the 1 from both sides. We've got this big ugly thing. vn over v0 to the 1 over n minus 1. Now you've got the correct formula for what you're looking for as a function of all the other pieces of information that you have. The only trick is figuring out on your calculator how to raise something to the 1 over something else. But you can do that. I'll walk off with my calculator back in. That's right, enjoy. Answer. You go home and practice, but, but here so that you know. I didn't show you the details. Okay. Again, we're just using this formula. We're rearranging it to solve for i. Then we plug in chub. And you'll end up with break even interest rate 7.2%. You can get a loan for 7.2 or lower. You'll make a little bit of money. The lower the better. Interest rates any higher than that, it's not worth the investment. You're gonna pay more than it's worth. Alright, we'll pick up from here next time. Hopefully I'll have your demand and supply homework created by then. Pick up an exercise on your way out the door. We won't be able to make it through the entire exercise quite yet, but make it as far as